I am so excited to be with you today. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, crafting career ladders for higher education administrative professionals. I am so um, just honored to be with you guys this morning. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello, my name is Danielle Miller. Uh, I am the Executive Director for Analytics and Communication at Lone Star College. So I work for our system office. Um, when I first came to Lone Star College, I uh, started I started at Lone Star College Tomball. So I am a Timberwolf at heart. So was there for the inception of HeapCon. And I just love this gathering. It is so needed. It is so exciting. And I'm just happy to be here with you guys. Um, some things about me. I have always worked in higher education. Um, I do not. I have basically two shows. You know how everybody has a show. You can share your show in the chat. My two shows never change. They are Parks and Rec and The Office. So I literally just keep watching the seasons over and over again. So that is a little fun fact about me. All right. So we're going to talk about, we're going to go over our agenda. So we're going to talk about career development, institutional career ladders, the role of supervisors and mentors, developing your specific career ladder, and navigating the job search. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. All right. So I want to know where you are. Um, so if you are, um, you know, familiar with all of these presentations, I'm sure you might have seen Minty before. You can use, uh, you can join at Minty.com using the code that's on the screen. You can also scan the QR code. We already have some things coming in. Yay. This is, I tested it, but this is my first time using the new Mentimeter add-in in PowerPoint. So you don't have to switch screen. So we're already getting our results in. So I just kind of want to get a pulse just to see where everyone is. Um, wanted to make sure that we are hitting some things that are relevant to you and relevant to where you are. So um, most of us, so we have about eight folks nine folks it's changing but most of us just kind of want to prepare but are you're not currently looking for a new opportunity which is awesome because we should always be thinking and preparing um about how we're going to advance our career so that's awesome so we kind of know where our where the majority of our folks in this session lie we do have a good amount of folks though who are actively looking for a new opportunity so I know that um, this session will be informative to both of you. Um, but for those of you who are looking for a new opportunity, we've got to, if you haven't done some of these things, then we've got to hit the ground running. So we need to start implementing some of these things um, now. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. So... Career development is very, very important. Um, I think a lot of times uh, some folks think that in certain positions that is not, but it is very important. Um, it's important for us, even if you're on and you're a supervisor, um, employees who believe that management is concerned about them as the whole person, um, not just an employee, are more productive, more satisfied, and more fulfilled. This is so important. So I work uh, specifically in the Office of Culture and Engagement at Lone Star College, and engagement is very important. Employee engagement is very important. It drives our success. It allows us to better serve our students. It allows us to better serve our communities. So we want our employees to be engaged. And career development is not just about personal growth. It's the cornerstone of institutional success. A lot of studies show that institutions with clear pathways for staff, the higher levels of job satisfaction, retention, and overall performance. And so we're going to talk about how to navigate the pathways if you have them. And if you don't have them, 
Uh, I know that sometimes our institutions, I've worked at several higher education institutions, and I know sometimes our institutions aren't built, they haven't built the pathways for you. Um, and so we'll talk about how to navigate and build your own pathway. So we'll just kind of start off with institutional career ladders. So a career ladder is a uh, structured sequence of job positions through which an individual can progress within the organization. Um, so, um, so yeah, so a career ladder is a structured sequence. So we'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there are clear benefits, but there's an example here. So um, some institutions have like ones and twos that go behind uh, different positions. So you could be an administrative assistant one, you could be an office administrator two or senior office administrator. Another example is you might move from administrative assistant to executive assistant to business manager. There's a lot of different ways where there's a clear delineation of how you grow in your career and also how you grow in your, um, as of course, a lot of times we want to grow because we want to see salary increases, right? We've done good work and we want to see salary increases. So we want to get additional positions or we want to move, we want to move up. And so um, that's kind of, if an institution has done the good work and really designed it in a way where there's a clear delineation, like if there's four steps in a position that allow me to get to, um, uh, that will, that will allow me to get to the salary that I want to get to, then that's how a uh, institution can develop the career, career ladder. Now I did say that I know that some institutions do not have that. We don't do the ones and twos. We don't make it clear that if I am an office administrator, what's my next step other than our regular merit increases or how do I get to the next pay grade? So we want to, if your institution has career ladders, we want to understand those. If they don't, don't worry. We're going to talk about building our own, which is something that I really, really enjoy. So it's really important that we connect with our supervisors and our mentors in this process. Um, the guidance of our supervisors and mentors is really, really important. Um, it's crucial for navigating the career ladder. And I also want to acknowledge that sometimes we don't always have a mentor or we don't always have a supervisor who is championing our growth. Um, and so if you don't, we're going to address that. But this is for those of us who have awesome supervisors. Um, I know a lot of us said that, you know, you just want to prepare, but you aren't actively looking. So you might have an awesome supervisor offering awesome leadership, but you just want to be able to know when the time comes and it's time for you to navigate to the next level that you can do so. So these relationships with support will provide support, advice, and access to opportunities. You need a champion a lot of times when you are navigating these different career opportunities within higher education. I know within my own career that uh, some of the opportunities that I have gotten is because I've had a champion who has been a supervisor or who has been a mentor or who has been a colleague who could speak to my great work and has allowed me to get access to um, you know, positions or been able to provide references that really gave me the opportunity to get another position. So tips for engaging with your supervisor and mentor. You should schedule regular check-ins no matter what because of the nature of your work. Um, also, when you are doing your performance goals or when you are, or even in performance evaluation time, talk to your supervisor about your um, desire for movement within the organization. If you don't have a supervisor that you feel like you can talk to about that with, connect with a mentor, connect with someone else, um, even outside your organization, so that they can help you navigate and think through some of the blind spots that might be there. You want to set clear career goals, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, as well as seek feedback and advice. Your supervisors might have some feedback for you that will help you um, develop some additional skills that you need to get to the next level. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. 
Let me advance the slide. Okay, so how do we develop our own career ladder? The first thing is self-assessment. You want to identify your strengths, weaknesses, as well as your professional interests. Consider tools like a SWOT analysis or any type of planning or strategy device that you will use, even if it's just a notebook and you're writing it down so you can understand where you stand. You need to know what you're good at. That is something that is crucial to getting to the next level and moving up or for advocating for yourself for you know a bump up in position grade or, or moving on to a next position, you have to be able to talk about you well. That's something that people really don't do often is we don't know how to talk about ourselves well. We need to know our strengths. You need to know that if you come into a department or if you go to a new institution, you can clearly state how I can, what, what you can bring and how you're gonna make that place better, how you're going to be able to operationalize success and excellence within that department. The next one is research. So you want to look into the qualifications and experiences needed for your next career step within, you know, higher education administration. So you want to, um, as we talk about kind of identifying in a little bit, you want to make sure that you're doing active research to know what it takes to have the position that you're thinking about going for. What are they looking for? What are their experiences that they need? Do they need someone who has financial experience? Do they need someone who has, you know, event planning experience, calendar management, business office management? You want to know what those things are, and then you can craft experiences in your current position that will help you be able to advocate for yourself in those spaces. The next one is planning. So you want to set SMART goals. I know people get tired of SMART goals, but it is so important. You want to know why SMART goals are so important? Because when we just write goals and we don't measure them and we don't put time on them, we don't, we don't put a we don't make them time bound, like we don't push ourselves to meet them at a certain space we often don't reach them. So when you are specific and measurable and achievable and relevant when creating your goals, you are going, you are more likely to achieve them because you've developed the steps to get to that goal. So you want to make sure that you are planning, that you are planning for your career ladder. You are having to develop this yourself or you're navigating your institution's career ladder. So if you're at an institution where you're an administrative assistant one and they might have an office administrator and that's a higher position or vice versa because every institution is different, um, you want to go and grab that job description. And most of those things are available on our institution's websites or in our institution's um. Uh, employee intranets, or even in HR, you want to grab that uh, job description and you want to print it out and you want to circle the things that are different from what, you do, what you're doing. And so you want to connect your current experience to, what is, to what's there. So you have to set goals to get the experience that you need to be able to navigate to the next space. So in developing our career ladder, we're going to start first with the self-assessment, we're going to research, and then we're going to start making our plan. Oh, oh, what happened? Okay, sorry. Let me make sure I'm still sharing. Okay, still sharing. All right. So identifying opportunities and setting goals. So the first thing uh, I would, we kind of talked about this already, is you're identifying opportunities within your institution or even outside of your institution. Research and identify potential growth opportunities. Um, you want to look for emerging projects that you can get connected to. You want to look at new departments or initiatives that align with your career interests and skills. If you've always worked in an academic area, but you kind of want to connect with um, students outside of the academic space, and you want to see if there's opportunities and student affairs or student services, 
Um, if you worked in budget management, but you, you know, maybe you want to try your hand at financial aid, you want to look into those opportunities and determine what it takes to get there. Understanding the requirements for each identify opportunity, understand what skills, experiences, and qualifications are required. This may involve informational inf interviews with those who already currently hold those roles that you aspire to, or discussions with, um, you know, your organizational development folks at your institution or your, your human resources department. So you, you want to get connected to those who are already in those roles. Understand their day-to-day. -day. Understand what is needed to be successful in those positions. You also, you know, can learn from those who, you know, we all know that there are rumor mills and people know information. So those who aren't necessarily successful in those roles. See what they're doing so you know what not to do. We can always learn from anything. And I'm sure, you know, we all know that things get around. So learning from those, learning from those uh, folks is still really valuable as you go through this process. So based on your self-assessment and the opportunities you, you've identified, going back, set those specific um, career goals. You've already identified what you're good at. Now you know the opportunities that you're interested in. So now we need to fill in the gaps. What are the gaps? We need to find experiences. We need to get connected with folks who can help us get experience in uh, those different projects that will help us get that next um, opportunity to move up. And then we want to um, create a timeline. So start thinking about milestones. Do you want to move up in one to two years? Do you want to move up in five years? Um, does that your next step require you to get additional edu education or a certification? Um, do you want to utilize the opportunities that you may have at your institution to get, you know, a, a data analytics certificate or a project management certificate? Um, I know that at Lone Star, you know, we offer free tuition to our employees. I know that not everybody, not every institution does that. But if your institution does do that and you need additional, you need additional credentials to get to the next step, then we need to create that timeline so we know, okay, I want to be a business manager. So I need to, you know, finish my bachelor's or I need to um, finish a master's degree or finish my associate's degree or get an accounting certificate. So we want to make sure that we identify what we need. I want to say this really quickly. Um, we often... Um, Jobs, we might not need the certification because we've had the the years of experience. But we when we're talking about pay, a lot of times those additional credentials, even if it's not, you know, a full associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or master's degree, those additional credentials could get you additional pay. So if there are opportunities where you can and you have the time and you have the ability, I do suggest that you really look at um, connecting with those opportunities within your institution. So developing skills and building your network. So identify the skills you need to develop or improve to achieve your career goals. Look for professional development opportunities such as these, such as workshops, seminars, online courses, or any other certification. Um, connect really, really become, you know, a knowledge bank, especially if you want to stay within the institution. I've known folks who have gone on to do great things and gotten, you know, promotions or gotten new opportunities because they learned the institution really well. So if you know the business portion of your institution really well, you have an opportunity to navigate throughout that institution and to really, really do some great things. You want to leverage um, on the job learning. So you want to seek out projects and tasks at your current job that can help you gain everything that you need, even if, out, even if it's outside the scope of your current work. So if you are volunteering for committees, if you're volunteering for different projects or initiatives within your institution, 
that is information that you can add to your resume. We've got to make sure that we include all of those things. Those things are relevant. It also shows that you're committed to the um, mission of the institution and you're committed to supporting all of your colleagues. Because uh, one of the things that we're looking for, especially as we're looking for folks in the administra in administrative professionals is those who can connect others and can get the work done. The, it's a lot of work. And so we need folks who can connect, who can build relationships and who are willing to network. Um, so you want to maintain that professional network within and outside your institution. As you're doing these, take some of these names down, these names down uh, that you're in sessions with. Connect with each other. Make sure you join HeapCon on LinkedIn and join the Facebook group. Make sure you're connecting with everyone because you never know when someone may have an opportunity or may have known you or have um, connected with you or have worked on a project with you. And they can lend, you know, their credibility to helping you get to the next space. So I know that in my own career, you know, working with working externally outside of my department, outside of my department on, you know, district level or system level projects have allowed me to, you know, have mobility within my career because folks were familiar with me and they were familiar with my work. This is a big one. One of the things that I think that folks, period, don't do enough is really seeking feedback. Um, regularly seeking feedback from peers, supervisors, and mentors on your progress towards, you know, your work as well as your career goals is important. We have to be open to constructive criticism and use it as a foundation for growth. Constructive criticism is so important. Um, a lot of times we emotionally get attached to projects and different things that we have uh, connected with for a long time. And so there could be better ways of doing things, especially in higher ed. A lot of times we do things uh, over and over again, or we do the same project, or we do the same event, or we do the same budget cycle development, or we're doing the same scheduling, scheduling building. Um, and we stick to just that way. And if we don't some and if we don't ask for feedback about is this really working for you? Is there something better that I can do? Is there something that you think we need to shift? You can when you open yourself up to constructive criticism that way, people know that you're not afraid of challenge and that you're not um, afraid of growth and you're not afraid to for things to change. Flexibility is really important in being able to move up. I have known people who have been, uh, you know, just so hardwired in the way that things have always been done, and they've been in a, they've been unable to move forward with flexibility as things change, and so they get left behind. And we don't want to get left behind. And the best way that we cannot get left behind, left behind, is being flexible and seeking feedback so that we can grow and we can change. So we want to make sure that we're focused on skill development, that we're leveraging all the on-the-job learning opportunities that we have at our institutions, and that we're networking, and that we're also seeking feedback. Networking is important. I'm not saying that you have to be disingenuous, but get to know people. Develop relationships with folks so that people can attest to your character and to your work ethic. All right, so we're now we're gonna talk about navigating the job search. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is understanding the higher education landscape. So you wanna familiarize yourself with the structure and culture of different institutions, such as community colleges or four-year universities or private universities. You Each institution has their own set of values, priority, priorities and expectations for you know, different roles. It's not the same at every institution, but if you're someone who is sticking within your own institution, familiarize yourself with the structure of different departments or different divisions. Understand how it works. If you're in academic affairs, if you're in facilities, if you're in um, student services or, or student life or student activities, 
Um, make sure that you, when you're thinking about moving around, that you understand the differences and what the work looks like a little bit. Of course, you won't fully know until you get into the role, but understanding that it's just not cut and paste. Um, I've had to do that even in my own career, from moving from department um, to another department, to the system office, um, understanding that it's not cut and paste. Um, and even though I'm in, within the same institution, there are different norms in every area. So we want to make sure that we're familiarizing ourselves with the structure and the culture of different institutions and our departments. Whenever you are in your job search, you want to tailor your application to that specific job. This is so important. Um, I know I we have a general basic resume, but I always, um, when I'm helping folks in their career development process, I'm taking the job description that they're applying for, and I'm looking at the keywords that are in that job description and I am adding them to their resume. I'm not adding additional things. I'm just recrafting some of those bullets to incorporate the keywords. And I'll tell you why. As a recruiter, I think, you know, they they have a lot of things to go through. So they're looking for how do you fit within this position, within this specific position as a hiring manager, as a search committee. They're, they've created a rubric to decide on how they're going to move candidates forward. So you want your materials to look like the job description, not exactly, but you want them to, to connect to the job description. That is really important. Customizing your resume and letter for each position is vital. It is crucial. Highlight experiences and skills that align with the job description and that specific institution or department's mission. Use the language that reflects that institution, that department, and that specific job. Make it easy, especially in the as we move towards you know this um our, this AI world, this artificial intelligence world, there, there are already places that already kind of put your materials and compare them with the job description and will create matches. Now, of course, higher ed doesn't always adopt things when they first come out, but eventually in the future, that might be something that recruiters are using. That might be something to help them um, do their jobs in a way that helps them be more efficient. So you want to make sure that it's easy to it's easy for the recruiter, the hiring manager, or the search committee to be able to connect your experience with what the job is looking for. You want to leverage your network. Use your professional network. Use those relationships that you've been building throughout your institution, that you've been building um, within these HeapCon groups within the HeapCon conference and making sure you're joining the, that HeapCon link on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. You want to um, learn about open, you can learn about open positions that way and gain insight into different institutions. You know, if you're, if you're switching for, um, from an institution within your city to another institution within your current city, if you've already built relationships with folks who are at that institution, you can call them and ask them about the culture so you can get some of the norms and some of the language that they use every day and that can be um and that can be used within your interview as well as within your application uh materials so you want to connect with colleagues and <laughs> he said that it's attend conferences like this um and participate in professional forums and things like that, tailoring to, you know, what you're looking for. So in thinking about um, making sure we're preparing for interviews, you want to uh, research the institution and the department thoroughly um, as much as you can. Find out as much information you can. Don't just look at the website. Um, there's opportunities to look for press releases to look on their social media pages. You know, um, as a former director of marketing um, for a college, lots of departments have their own uh, to, to our, you know, sometimes the marketers in the room and the communications folks 
we get scared when departments within our institutions create their own social media pages. And so um, a lot of them have them. So go check out what they're doing, check out their social media, or even just check out the general institution because you can glean the culture a little bit from what they're posting, from the tone that they're using when they're writing their captions on social media. So you want to go out and look for that. And then be ready to discuss how your experience aligns with the role. And you want to make sure that you are crafting insightful questions. It is so important for you as a candidate to bring some really great questions that can really help you set up, be set apart and stand out amongst the crowd when you come in with some really, really great questions to ask them, talking about what does it look like um, for somebody to be successful in this role? What, what kind of traits do they have? Tell me about the biggest project that this um, organization, that, that, that this department has ever put on. How did you achieve success? If you didn't achieve success, what are some things that you're looking for in a candidate to help you ensure that the next time you do it, you have success? Being Thinking critically about questions that you can share uh, to be able to glean more information from the um from the hiring committee is really important. Because another thing about interviews is you're interviewing them as well. You're not just going in just because you want a job. You want to know if this department, if this institution is going to be a good fit for you. Are you going to have safety there? So I like to talk about um, 360 cycle, uh, 360, 360 degree safety, physical safety, psychological safety, and um, mental safety. So you want to know that is this place going to be, you know, good for my mental health? Are they, um, do they have policies in place? Do they have practices in place that allow me to ensure that I am successful, that I am well, that I'm taken care of? Um, is it a toxic environment? Can I, can I glean from the situation? Is there constant turnover? Um, so then I can know this place might not be psychologically safe. Of course, people leave positions for different things, but, you know, sometimes the proof is in the pudding. And then, of course, physical safety. Is this place, you know, safe for me? Am I going to be okay? Are they taking the necessary steps to ensure that, um, my safety is taken care of. So you want to interview them as well. They're not just interviewing you. You are interviewing them because you don't have to accept every opportunity. There will be more. Trust me. You don't have to take every opportunity. There will be more. All right. And the last one is you want to showcase your impact. We want you to provide concrete examples of how you have contributed to your current or past institutions. This can include projects you've led and have been successful and make sure you can provide metrics. Um, you could say um, my support for XY recruiting event caused, you know, this many students to, you know, fill out in, uh, um tell me more information cards, or I've been able to um, decrease our budget by 10, I've, I've been, not decrease our budget, but I've been able to decrease our expenditures in a certain area and reallocate funds to more pressing needs by examining the budget and doing, you know, critical analysis of it. People get scared when you say decrease the budget, but you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Um, you want to be able to share those concrete examples of things that you've led, improvements that you implemented, or initiatives you've been a part of that have had a significant impact. And you want to celebrate yourself. Part of that is always thinking about who you are. I know people don't always don't believe this. Um, it, I know everyone doesn't believe this, but in this age, you really are your own personal brand that you have to steward. 
And so you've got to get good about talking about you and talking about how you are able to move an organization forward, how you're able to support a leader, how you're able to support, you know, a department head, how you're able to support individuals within the institution to reach their goals and to be able to ensure um, that things don't fall through the cracks, that you have great attention to detail, um, that you're a team player, and that you're willing to go the extra mile to ensure that everyone has have everything that they need. Administrative professionals are the heartbeat of our institutions. You run the colleges. You run our institutions. You make sure that things go. Nothing happens without you. And so you've got to be able to package that and be able to sell that as a potential candidate. And don't be shy about it. You know that your work is essential to the success of this institution, to the success of your department. If you don't make it go, a lot of times we don't even know how to do it. So if you don't make it go, it doesn't get done. And you got to be able to share that and to share it confidently um, so that you can show how you're going to be an asset to the organization. Um, as you're navigating the job search, you want to make sure that you're going through kind of all of these steps and thinking through how you're going to be impactful in your job search. And like I said, remember, you are also interviewing them. You are also interviewing them. And I know that um, we're getting close to our time and I wanted to leave at least five minutes for questions. Um, but when you're packaging your career ladder, uh, if your institution, like I said before, has a clear pathway for you in your current area, that is great. You know that you can stay within the same position to move um, forward and to move up, then that's awesome. Um, one of the things that I did want to hit on really quickly is if you're going to be staying in that same position and you're just going to be advocating for, you know, I want to go from a one to a two or from a regular to a senior how do we craft those conversations with our employers um, and with our supervisors? I think that you have, you talk to them about that um, during your performance evaluation time, during your one-on-ones. You want to talk to them about that. You want to talk about your expectations. Um, if you have been, you know, a, a, a two for three years and you want to know the plan for when you're going to become a three or a four, that is fair. You have to go in, um, craft your plan, and talk about all the things that you've done, showcase your impact again, showcase what you've done, showcase what you've been successful at, show how you've improved the organization or the department, and then ask your supervisor, is there a plan? A lot of times as administrative professionals, you also know how things get done. You know how people get moved up to a certain uh, pay band, or you know how people get moved up um, to a, a certain level. Understand those dynamics. If you don't, talk to your supervisor about it. Ask them, what's the process for me to be moved from, you know, a coordinator two to a coordinator three, or or to a um, from a coordinator to a manager? How does that happen? Um, ask them, have those questions. You have to have the hard questions. Um, sometimes I think we expect for people to create um, positions for us. And that's great because there are supervisors who do that. I'm one of those supervisors who, when I'm looking and I'm like, okay, I need to create a plan for that person so they can um, go to the next level because they're valuable to not my department. Now, I also don't want to stifle your growth but they're valuable to my department. So I want to make sure that they are um, compensated well and that they are not, that I acknowledge them for their hard work and realize that they should be, you know, a manager instead of a coordinator. So um, have those hard conversations. You want to craft, you want to think hard about it, set goals, write down that impact. So when you have that conversation with your supervisor, you can have it at performance review time or you can pick a time um, during your regular check-ins and your regular one-on-ones. 
to really have a conversation about what what it looks like for your progression and ask them if they want to partner with you and developing that ladder and developing your specific career ladder. All right, it's 1126 and I think we end at 1130. So I want to leave some time for questions. I can't see the chat, so I'm going to try to pull it up. Um, and I'm watching it, Danielle, if you need okay. help. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, shoot some questions to me if there are any. If I can pull it up. Okay. Oh, I got the thing. I got the thing. I recently had a grad assistant. So we got some really, it was obvious to me which of the applicants relied on chat GPT and AI to compose their letters. Yeah, AI definitely has a, a voice to it. Um, and I had over 12 applicants. The person I let person I personalized letters immediately distinguished those who genuinely cared about the opportunity. Oh yeah, word cloud. That's a really, really good idea. These are so great. If you want to unmute yourself and ask Danielle a question, please feel free to do so. For um, other oh. Danielle, I, yeah. I don't know if I'm raising my hand. My name's Lisa Brennan. I have been a 35 year K through 12 educator or librarian for relocating and decided I wanted to get into higher ed and okay. admin staff. Okay. What I wanted to let you guide others toward is if you haven't written a resume since 1990 and you're leaving your institution and looking a broader place, there are so many new guidelines. And if you're an older employee, I learned I didn't need to put down the date I graduated from college. I can clear myself of any ageism issues by doing that. And I do not have a pocket of go here to this LinkedIn voice to learn how to stay up to date with how things are working now. But I wish someone, whether it's HeapCon or another resource, could sort of centralize that information because there are a lot of people who bring extraordinary value, but who haven't needed to go through those steps in several years. And man, it has it has changed. Don't, don't you agree there's a change now versus oh, yeah. 15, 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. No, well, I would say that just the job, um, the environment has just changed so much specifically because of, you know, we have even more uh, generations in the workplace. And so um, the way we work is completely different. So I do agree. Um, if you are remove those barriers. Um, I have a lot of people who even don't put their full on resumes. I mean, when you pull in the application, it has to be, but even on resumes, don't put their full um, name. They might just go by, they might have, you know, initials, last name, um, just to kind of eliminate any bias. But I do think that um, I will say that list all of your experience because mm -hmm. specifically at Lone Star, um, that your experience is calculated in your pay. So make sure you list all of your experience in the list of time. Um, and that could be something uh, that you you give back on the back end, like, you know, if you're, if you're moving forward. But um, yeah, you can definitely eliminate those barriers and move those things. Uh, I think that it also, different institutions have and it, and it kind of even goes to different hiring managers. So they might be looking for, they might like a different hiring manager might like a resume a certain way. You don't know that, but I would just say, make it clear and easy to understand. Don't let your bullets be too long. Um, you want people to be able to scan a lot of times, especially on the search committees when they have to go through, you know, 40 resumes. You want to make sure that it's easy for them to find those keywords and easy for them to be able to connect your experience with the job description. Okay, we have one minute. I'm sorry. 
anything less. It's the better to shorten your. I, so I I can talk about our institution. Our institution is best that you list everything. There are some folks who uh, there's a question about is it better to shorten your resume or list everything. I uh, I my personal belief is, is is you list everything so we can get a full picture of everything that you can bring to the institution. I read resumes. That's my I love reading resumes. I love reading cover letters. So when we had um our comment about the AI cover letters, yes, you can definitely feel the AI tone. So. 20 seconds. I think we're going to be moved. Thank y'all so much. I had such a good time with y'all. Um, please feel free to reach out and I'd be more than happy to talk offline.